Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Aquarium Online Academy. We're going to talk about adaptations today. But just like always, you get to participate. Allie's on question control. You can text us questions at 562-286-1838, and Allie will help bring them into the studio. Now, if you want to ask us really complex questions or you're watching after we air live, you can email us too. So right under that phone number, we have our email, live at lbaop.org. Emily is helping out behind the, the booth to get all the fun stuff we're going to look at. But let's talk about adaptations, like what they are first. So before we talk about who's got what, let's figure out what an adaptation is. Do you know what an adaptation is? Do you, have you heard that word before? Hmm. Well, we've probably heard that things have adapted to conditions or like we've adapted to social changes. Hmm. But what is an adaptation really? In science and biology, it's something that helps living things survive. Well, what are those? Is that like glasses? Is it like my jacket? Well, those might help me, but it's not really something that I have within my body or a behavior that I do. So adaptations biologically are things in the animal's body that they have to help them survive. Like a good example would be fingers. So we have developed fingers evolutionarily over time and that helps us. Not all things have opposable thumbs. That's kind of a big determining thing about peoples. We have opposable thumbs. We can grab stuff with our hands. We have a lot of ability to do things with our hands. For sea otters not having thumbs, they actually are pretty, pretty dexterous. They have a lot of ability to take things apart. So some things don't need thumbs. Some things do need thumbs. Or if you're like an eel, you have no appendages, not even fins. So some living things have different parts to them that'll help them move around explore their environment so our senses are adaptations too smell taste touch sound and sight all those things help us explore our environment and they can help us survive so when we think of adaptations these are things that are within the body of whatever it is it we plant animal algae whatever that help them survive Okay, well, let's start getting some good examples of them. We talked about a, one for us, fingers, our senses. What else helps us survive? What else about us is helping us survive? Well, we have lungs to breathe air. Okay, we have, we have feet we can walk around or run around. And ooh, uh, what else? There's so many. So our bodies have all these special parts to them that help keep us going, keep us alive. Well, let's compare how we are different to other types of animals. One of my favorite fish here at the aquarium is called the spiny lump sucker. Almost can't get any more different than us to a spiny lump sucker. Let's take a look and let's see if we can figure out what helps them survive. Now, lump suckers are some of them are bigger. Some of them are about the size of a baseball. These are about the size of a ping pong ball at most. So even though it looks pretty big here, it's actually about that big. It's a really tiny animal. So what, uh, what do you see on our lump sucker friend that could help it survive? It has these eyes right here. So they have eyes to see their environment. That's a really good adaptation. Is it whistling underwater? No. So what is it doing? It's breathing. They are fish. They have gills. What else do you think could be a really interesting adaptation for this animal? Is this fish swimming around like we might see all the fish doing in Blue Cavern or Shark Lagoon? No. It's just kind of sitting there. What if their fins are no longer really good at swimming? Remember that eel didn't have any fins, so fins really do help things swim most of the time. But sometimes you need to be really good at this, sitting still. So 
So they have adapted to have really good fins for suctioning down. See these fins right here? They, their fins are really good holding on to stuff. So it's almost like they're in the shape of like a suction cup on their underside. And they can hold on to a surface with those little fins. Well, why would you want to not swim around if you're a fish? It seems like that would make things tougher, wouldn't it? Hmm. Well, they've adapted different things, different abilities to survive. Think of a frogfish or a stonefish. They kind of sit around most of the time. It's really awkward trying to watch any of those three fish. Three fish. Stonefish, frogfish, or lump suckers try to swim because their fins are so reduced in swimming abilities that they really don't help them swim at all anymore. Now, the frogfish, the fins are so like wide and they've angled almost like this that they're more like legs at this point. Well, the lump sucker and... The stonefish still have fins, but their bodies are really dense and designed to sit on something. So when they swim around, it takes a lot of effort. Now, frog, uh, the, the stonefish, they have to really start flapping to swim. I've seen them try to get up to the top of their exhibit to eat before. And it's kind of comical because their bodies just aren't adapted to swimming anymore. Well, lump suckers are uh, even more comical in terms of swimming because they are small, so they aren't too heavy to swim around. But they really have to struggle to move where they want to in the exhibit. So when they swim, they are putting as much effort into it as possible. They're almost shaking their whole body. So instead, they sit. Even when the seaweed is blowing around in the water, they sit. That's pretty interesting. A fish that will ride a piece of seaweed instead of swimming around. Well, let's think about how they have to survive if they sit instead of swim. They have to be able to catch their food still. So just like the stonefish or the frogfish, they're ambush predators. When they ambush their food, they have to gulp their food in really fast. They don't chase it down. They just wait for it to get close. And then they can open their mouth really wide, really fast, and they can just sweep that food in really quickly. So ambush predators can sit still. Now the sea bass we saw on Blue Cavern is kind of like an ambush predator. It doesn't swim very fast very often. It has a very big paddle-like tail, which when it starts really swimming, it can sprint pretty good. But for the most part, it's very slowly, lazily swimming. And if you're going to appear to be not dangerous at all. You might as well look like a rock swimming around. And then when you need to, they will open their mouth really wide and suck their food in really quickly. Now the mouth of a sea bass, almost like a grouper, is so large, it looks like you could almost just like push a bowling ball through them because their mouth and their throat are so big. They will vacuum in food so quickly, their food can't really swim away from them. Now the sea bass, does have to be able to get close enough to their food. So if they just kind of very slowly drift around, get close enough, their food might figure it out and swim away. And they can sprint to try and still catch them. But you don't want to waste too much energy getting to your food if you're not going to be able to eat it. So there's a balance in the living world about how things do this. Now here's an extra fish down here hiding behind the kelp and the other sea bass. They're really good at hiding. These spots are unique to each fish. It's a form of camouflage, though. When you break up the pattern of a fish or a thing in the water, like these have, you can't see the shape of it. It's harder to find it. Or if you're their prey, it's harder to realize that's a sea bass before you get too close to it. That's pretty cool. Now, we don't have camouflage. We copied the animals, and we created our own. So for humans, our brains are a really good adaptation. We have learned how to copy or mimic a lot of the things that we see in the animal world, and we use them to improve our own lives. Hello, sea bass. They love getting really close to the camera. And in some cases, you'll just see this giant eyeball on the camera. Now, currently, our Blue Cavern camera is not functional. This is a highlight reel, but they're still so cute so awkward when they come up to watch you. And they do watch you. That's kind of fun thing to think about too is 
you're looking in at them and they're looking out at you. <laughs> I don't think it bumps the camera in this case. Nope, it, it, it's going to avoid it. Oh, sea bass. Now, sea bass have these pretty good adapt adaptations. Their size makes them pretty tough for other things to try and hunt them when they're uh, adults. When they're younger, though, their colors are different, so they can hide in the kelp and the seaweed. And a lot of fish are like that. When they're younger, their coloration is different than when they're an adult, and that helps them hide. For a baby Garibaldi, they don't really need to hide. Garibaldi might be orange, like the baby sea bass, but instead they have these fantastic blue spots. Why would you want to be more visible if you were a baby fish? Don't you want to hide? Well, one of the adaptations Garibaldi have are that they are super sassy. They have a big attitude for being a small fish. They will chase away fish much larger than them, and even sea bass or even sometimes sharks. Now, the color on the babies helps signal to the other adults, you don't have to give me attitude. I'm not going to hang out. I'm not stealing your territory. So their, their coloration is a signal to other Garibaldi that they can be left alone. It's fine. I'm just passing through. I'm not going to do anything because Garibaldi really are territorial and try to protect the space they've determined is their little nest. So if you're a baby fish, you're really not going to nest there. Your coloration will help signal to everybody else, I'm okay, leave me alone, it's fine, you don't have to worry about me. But for other animals, their juvenile coloring is much better camouflage because they don't really need the same kind of camouflage when they're adults. Or in some cases, they have really good camouflage throughout their entire life. Do you know an animal that has really, really good camouflage? Alex helped us count how many arms they have. We sometimes consider them to have tentacles, but when you talk about these animals, their relatives might have tentacles and arms. We generically call them tentacles, but they're actually a little bit different. The octopus has really, really impressive camouflaging skills. An octopus can change both the color of its skin and the texture of its skin. So they don't have juvenile to adult coloring changes. It's pretty much the same all the time. But because they can control the color of their skin in an instant, they don't have to have baby colors versus adult colors. They can change the color all the time. Now, octopus will start very small when they first hatch. So it's kind of a tough life when you start out as an octopus. But when they grow up, and they grow up fast because they don't have a very long lifespan, they have to grow up pretty quickly so that they can try and have their own babies. They can hide really well because they can also squish into very small spaces. An octopus has no bones or hard parts, which is an interesting adaptation in itself. And because of that, they can hide in spaces that other things can't get to. So when we watch this octopus move around, if it can't hide between the rocks, it might try to hide right on top of the rock. Check that out. Look at all these little kind of spiny little projections coming off of their skin. So they will try to copy not only the color of the things they're sitting on, but the texture of what they're sitting on. It's kind of an in-between where the video ended up stopping. We can play it again because it's really fun to watch. Normally their skin is really smooth, but if they want to, they can alter the texture of their skin very, very well. So their camouflage abilities are an impressive adaptation. I said not having, bones is, not having any bones is an adaptation too. What do bones do for us? I can stand up straight on land. That helps. I can move around. Yeah, so our bones help us move. The muscles that are in our bodies connect to the bones. And the muscles help provide the movement, but the skeleton is our structure. They don't need the skeleton for structure because if they're underwater and they need to squish in between spaces, they don't need hard parts. We can't squeeze into as many hidey holes as they can. They would be hide and seek champions if we got to play against them. All right. So uh, let's see, what else does an octopus have? Oh, here's a two spot octopus. And now this is actually pretty close to its normal coloring, but in a, even its normal coloring kind of blends in with the environment. Now, there are two spots because they have a spot on either side of their head, right here, that almost looks like an eye. So under the normal, like actual colors, they're a little more tan. And then these spots are kind of black and blue to look like eyes. They're realized 
right here are actually very advanced. So we think of eyes as uh, a scale of how advanced an animal might be. If you're a jelly, you have eye spots. You can only see bright or dark. If you have a complex eye, like mammals, birds, cephalopods, a lot of fish have complex eyes, you have a little bit different ability. Now for us, our eyes pointing this way give us a different adaptation than an octopus. So animals on land, the eyes kind of follow a rule of what direction they point tells you about the animal. Predators or omnivores in many cases will have two forward-facing eyes or almost forward-facing eyes to give us binocular vision. It gives us uh, depth perception. We can tell how far away something is. Like this sea otter can only die for three to five minutes. It's going to need to know how far away that clam is in order to be able to swim down and get it fast enough. So if they don't have binocular vision, it's harder to uh, gauge or judge where that thing is at to grab it. You can test this out on your own. Even though you know where everything is in your house, if you went around with like an eye patch or one hand over your eye and tried to not bump into stuff, it gets tougher. So forward facing eyes for most land animals and some aquatic animals really help with their hunting instincts, their hunting abilities. If your eyes point sideways, it's for greater view. You want to be able to see anything approaching you. So like our giant sea bass have eyes that point mostly sideways. Even though they're predators, they need to be able to look around and make sure that they can find food. So their eyes point somewhat forward, but are still mostly side to side. This gives them more of a panoramic view around their body. Like this one. The eyes are exactly on either side of their body. They're, they're very skinny, so their eyes are on either side. A butterfly fish is going to need to be able to avoid predators as much as possible. Now, just like that octopus, notice this dark spot? Remember what we said that was? It's a false eye spot. Now, the other cool thing about butterfly fish is almost every species of butterfly fish has this stripe going through their eye right here or their face is completely shaded differently from the rest of their body. And that way, if you were a predator and you couldn't see very well, or you weren't a very smart predator, you might be confused what side is the face or where the face is in general. So false eye spots will hide where their faces are and their eyes are hidden so that the animal can't, the predator can't figure out where their face is at. So that's a really interesting adaptation too. Colors that help you hide in plain sight. Hmm. So some animals need color changes to hide extremely well, hide and seek champions. Some animals need different colors as babies to either hide better or to signal to other adults, don't worry about me. But in other cases, animals have to hide in plain sight. Now my favorite hide and seek in plain sight champion is the sea dragon. Sea dragons, unlike their seahorse cousins, don't have a, a prehensile tail. So their tail can move, but they don't grab stuff with it like a seahorse does. Instead, the sea dragons hide among the sea grasses and, and uh, seaweeds and move just like the seaweed does. Like, oh, I'm seaweed, you can't find me. They're hiding in plain sight, moving and hanging out right alongside their plant and algae relative or friends in, in that area. And their other relatives actually hide on the objects and pretend to be part of the grass. So they float around and their movement actually is part of their camouflage. That's an interesting adaptation. So here's the leafy sea dragon. We were looking at the weedy sea dragon earlier. The leafy sea dragons really have these uh, extensions, these little fan-like things to the body to help them look like sea grasses and seaweed. But their fins are right here and one right there. That's it. They don't really have big fins. They don't need to swim very fast. They just need to kind of gently float and stay stable right in the seaweed. All right? So movement can also be a part of your adaptation, how you move. Very interesting. Now, let's think about some other terrestrial or pseudo partially terrestrial animals. So birds are either all the way on land or some of our bird friends spend a lot of time in the water too. So we talked about puffins in our last class. They live on the Northern hemisphere. Penguins live on the Southern hemisphere and they don't crisscross. 
They don't go around the equator because the equator's too warm for them. They like to be where it's colder, or at least more temperate. So puffins tend to be in much colder habitats. Penguins will be at most north is the uh, Galapagos Islands. That's at the equator. But the water at the Galapagos Islands is pretty chilly. So they really aren't going past a certain point with water temperatures. They're not crisscrossing the equator. Now, even though these can fly and they do have a little bit of a migratory pattern, they're not going to migrate all the way around like some birds do. So they pretty much stay where it's cold. And because of that, being separated that much, they've kind of adapted the same job. Or in ecology, we call it a niche, the same role. What does it do in the environment? They eat fish and krill. So do penguins. They're black and white. So are penguins. Now, the coloring can really help with when you're swimming in the water. This coloring, dark on the back, light on the belly, is called countershading. A lot of animals have countershading. Now, it's just after molting season for the penguins. When they molt all those feathers off, they don't want to swim around. But right after molting season is their migratory season. So our penguins, even though they're not migrating, will be in the water a lot more often. Now our, our cameras, we have a overwater camera, which we're looking at now. We also have an underwater camera. And the underwater camera is going to get a whole lot more activity because they like to be in the water right now. Now Doris asked, why do some penguins have yellow and orange? Why did some of the puffins have yellow and orange too? Hmm. Some of those colors are not for hiding. They're for looking extra fabulous. Sometimes the colorations are to attract mates. So the yellow on emperors and king penguins and the fantastic like hairdos that the macaroni penguins have, some of that is to help attract a mate. So the black and white is to counter shade apart from their prey or their predators. They will have to hide from them too. But a lot of these other colors are to help look extra healthy and robust and I am a big fancy penguin. I will have lots of babies. Some of the colors on animals help determine that they're a healthy example of that species. Think of most birds that are flying birds, terrestrial birds, songbirds. A lot of the males are the really colorful example of that species. And it's to tell the females, I'm a very healthy bird. We should have kids. That's how it is. They have dances that they perform for the female birds, or in some cases, like uh, I think it's bower birds create a special nest that's all designed for something. But then there's other birds that male and female don't have any differences. So the penguins, these birds, these are the uh, crested auklets. They really don't have any big differences between male or female. And neither do the lorikeets that we have here at the aquarium. So a lot of birds will have male-female differences, and it's to attract the mate. If they don't have to do those activities to attract a mate, you probably won't see much difference between male and female. Not even their size will be really that different. So here's a couple of lorikeets. These are green-naped lorikeets. Actually, I think that one might be a Swainson. But these are two lorikeets hanging out, and they're very social. So social structures are also an important adaptation. Ants have a very important social hierarchy. That's an adaptation to help them survive. Birds have a social adaptation to help them survive. A lot of animals, when they forage for food, might signal to other members of their species or their immediate group of uh, friends or cohort, whatever group they're in, to signal, hey, there's more food over here than they all can feed. And they try to prevent other animals from getting it. One of the funniest things watching the lorikeets here at the Aquarium of the Pacific is when they don't want to share food, and that's okay, the birds don't have to share, how upset they get that another bird tried to eat from the same spot, like, excuse me, my spot. And then the birds will try to argue and bump each other out so that they get more food. That competition is very normal. It's very healthy for the birds to feel like they need to compete, but we provide so much food. There's no, no reason that they need to share because there's always food that will be provided for them. So some animals compete even though there's no reason to. And just like the fish that try to steal all the food from the giant sea bass. We have a diver try to feed specifically just the giant sea bass. And they have to protect the food from the other fish getting there. Even though all the other fish get fed too, it's part of their natural design in their brain to try and get more food. All right? So that's just part of nature is that 
organisms want to get enough food to survive. And because of the what's called feast or famine idea where they get a lot of food for a little bit and, and maybe they won't for a little bit, they try to eat as much food as possible when that is available just in case they don't get to eat for a while. Well, oh man, that's a lot of adaptations we talked about. Let's see if Emily can pick a really fun animal for all of us to try and observe and find some adaptations on. I don't know what Emily's going to pick. So let's see if we can work together. Now that we know about adaptations, what they are, a lot of examples of good adaptations. Behaviors can sometimes be adaptations. Using structures or tools. Oh, the sea otter. Well, we talked about their eyes, so we can't use that answer. Well, what, what other things might help a sea otter survive? Hmm. Let's think together. Okay, well, sea otters are mammals, all right? What makes a mammal a mammal? That's important because that helps not only us define the sea otter, but they use those things to survive too. All right, so they have all this fur. Their fur is really important. They have the densest fur of any animal. They can have up to a million hairs in a square inch of space. So about the size of a quarter, you could count up to a million hairs if you wanted to count to a million. It takes a long time, don't do that. So fur is a really good one. They also have these really special furry parts right here, these whiskers. Their whiskers are a sensory organ to help them explore their environment. Hmm. Now they do have a nose, but do they smell underwater? Well, they have to breathe air, so I don't think they want to snort any water. Actually bad if you're a mammal, don't snort the water. So their noses are going to be important for other things. And maybe their sense of smell won't be as strong as their sense of hearing. It's not as sens uh, sensitive to uh, receiving those signals. So their sense of sight and their sense of hearing, those are little ears, should be really good for when they hunt underwater because the water can be pretty murky. So their eyes need to be able to see pretty well. But then their sense of hearing is going to help them also when they're hunting for their food. Now, their advantage is they hunt food that sits still most of the time. They're not chasing fish. They might eat a fish now and again, but it's not the main part of the diet. They're eating things that are sitting on the ground, not moving anywhere. So their sight probably isn't the best adapted for movement. Some predators, they have really good sight to watch movement. But if their food sits still, they probably don't have to try and find a lot of movement. Ah, see, there's a, no, no thumbs. They can't just be like, Arr. they need to use both paws when they feed. Now, the ice that they're on helps keep them cool. That fur is so thick that if they stay out of water for too long, they could overheat. The reason they would overheat is because they have like a little furnace inside them. Their metabolism runs so high. They're burning so many calories so fast that they release a lot of body heat. Well, because of that, they don't need blubber. Seals and sea lions and whales and dolphins, they need blubber, but not a sea otter. Its body heat help, helps keep it warm without needing that extra layer of fat to provide this like jacket on the inside protection. So that's a pretty good adaptation. Well, we're pretty much out of time, my friends. Thank you so much for learning with us today and talking about adaptations. Now, whenever you go exploring on your own and you see any living thing, now we've talked about animals, but we didn't really talk about the plants or the algae. Let's see if you, when you go exploring, can figure out some adaptations about the non-animal part of all the living things in this planet. They have their own adaptations too. Well, from all of us here at the Aquarium Online Academy, Thanks for hanging out with us this morning. We'll be back on, on Wednesday to talk to you more about some really cool topics. So tune in Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays to learn more from us at the Aquarium of the Pacific.